Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 16. Jeremiah 6, 10 through 16. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore I am full of fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband and the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. The great prophet, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, was in the last days of the city of Jerusalem as Nebuchadnezzar and the army of Babylon besieged it. He had been called at a very critical time in the history of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel had already been carried away into Assyrian captivity. There never would be a remnant come back from it as there would be after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. The great prophet, the messianic prophet, Isaiah, who prophesied some 700 or so years before Jesus walked this earth, had warned Israel repeatedly of her sins. Yet she would not hear nor take heed. Now Jeremiah had been called to be a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. But as many times preachers do, he felt ill-equipped for the task because of his age. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. But God had other plans indeed. We read, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw back, to build, and to plant. Jeremiah 1 verses 9 and 10. And if you go later into the book, Jeremiah's apprehension would come forth again. The drive to preach, though, was stronger than the fear that he may have possessed. In Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, there's recorded these wonderful words. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I would not stay. I've always thought, having been involved with preachers all of my late teen life and all of my adult life, that unless there was this disposition of zeal within a preacher, he ought not preach. He ought to go to plowing or something else. 
but he would have to learn too much to know how to plow nowadays. But anyway, he ought to do something else. There must be, if a preacher is going to be what God says the preachers ought to be, ought to be, there must be a burning zeal to live according to the truth, to stand for the truth, to proclaim the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's word, and to expose error and defend the faith. If that's not within a preacher, he's worthless. Every member of the church to a degree ought to have that desire burning in them because of what the Word of God is, what the love of God is, and what the need of the world is. The times of Jeremiah were very much like our times. It was a period of wealth. It was a period of prosperity. Yet, lacking in and very poor in spirituality and godliness. Sometimes we think, well, we've only seen the United States this is about all there is. We live here. We experience it. We've seen it come from this point down to this point, and none of it's good. Well, no, that's happened time and time and time and time again throughout the world's history. And even now, especially as we read, this is among God's chosen people, chosen for the purpose that he chose them from which the Messiah would come, and yet it was happening to them. In Jeremiah, the book, we find a picture of, the only thing you can call it is a hellish society as, as we notice how it came to be. And I want to look at, and there may be more, but I want to look at uh, several steps, five steps of destruction that are set out in the prophet that took place that caused Jerusalem and Judah to come to the position that it's in. First of all, we read about it in verse 10, Jeremiah 6, 10. The word of the Lord was a reproach. Now, to say that you've been reproached about something or that you hold something that should be held in very high esteem, but you don't, then that puts it in the position of being reproached. Now, they may have verbally said, Oh, God is our God and the law of Moses is the greatest and we're special from all people on the earth. But they went and lived like they wanted to live. They did as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life guided them. In chapter 8 in verse 9, we see that the wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? How up to date that is. Seeing people say, well, I'm acceptable to the Lord. But they don't know enough about the Bible to fill a gnat's thimble. And, and they care less about it than that. They operate on some basis other than the authorized will of heaven set out in the words of the Bible. They're corrupt. Uh, just, just look at how fornication and adultery is on every hand in our country today. Well, it was like that in ancient Israel. They were a people who obeyed not the voice of the Lord. And they would not be corrected. Jeremiah 7 verse 28. Well, they wouldn't be if they, as it was, held the Lord's word and reproach. It's no wonder that they went backward and not forward. Isaiah 7 and verse 24. It may seem to people that to live like the Bible says, to solve life's problems with how the Bible says to solve them. That, well, you're just an old moss back. You're behind the times. You ought to come of age. This is the 21st century and so forth and so on. That never meant anything to me. I've been hearing that all my life. Well, this is the 1960s. This is the 1980s. This is the 1990s. So what? They used to talk about that in the 19th century by saying, well, it's the 1890s. And then there was, in the 20th century, why well, it's the Roaring Twenties that ended up uh, in the Depression in World War II, the 30s and 40s. So what are, what are you saying? These are just sayings, and that's all there are to them. Everyone, according to Jeremiah, in our second point, was given to covetousness, Jeremiah 6.13. 
So when you get all beside yourself over covetous people today, you love money and all they think about is money, then know that uh, that's happened before. Isaiah would describe the people as greedy dogs which can never have enough. Isaiah 56, 11. I think he should have gone to school and learned to be politically correct. Now, well, that's just the way I see that. That's the way most people say it. He's just too harsh. Don't be so blunt. But this had to do with truth. It had to do with God's people not being God's people, but calling themselves God's people while they transgressed God's will. This was a, a sad situation, and there's no other way to put it. We must realize that covetousness is idolatry, and we must be aware of it. People say, well, we don't have idolatry today. Covetous can be idolatry. Paul said so. He wrote by the Holy Spirit. He was writing part of the New Testament. It will read that way on the Day of Judgment. So we can't have our idols today. What is an idol anyway? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be Zeus or Apollo or Baal or Asheroth. It can be anything and is anything that we put before service to God. Paul talked about this in Colossians 3, 5. And it was even mentioned in the days of Christ on earth in Luke 12 and verse 15. You cannot purchase the forgiveness of one's sins or salvation with silver and gold or any material thing of value. Zephaniah 1 verse 18. Nor is God Almighty impressed with treasures that we accumulate here on earth. Jesus taught so very much about the right attitude toward God, toward oneself, toward others, and toward the Word of God, toward why we're here, what's the purpose of being here, and all of this. And one thing he emphasized was is that we must not lay up treasures in heaven as we walk so contentedly in those things here, Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Even there is a rebuke to those to whom the Hebrews letter was written in Hebrews 13, 5 in the way that set out that everybody, and God included, knows you have to have things to function. There has to be some form of uh, money. But what was the problem here? Covetousness, which is idolatry. That's what they lived for. That's all they sought after. That was their God. So when you think of the sin of covetousness, just think of it as another God rather than the God of the Bible. Then there was this that they were doing in the last days of Jerusalem. They said, peace, peace. When there is no peace. Jeremiah 6, 14. They were a people who did not recognize the problems that surrounded them. We talked some about that this morning. They did not see things as problems with God. They lived for the here and now. They lived to do as they pleased. They weren't about to be corrected. They weren't about to be turned. They were going to live like they wanted to. And yet still say, well, God's with us. The cry of the time of Jeremiah was, well, God's not going to let anything happen in Jerusalem. By well, the temple's here. The temple, the temple. That's where God dwells. He won't let anything happen here. So we can live any way we please. But it doesn't work that way. The Bible speaks of false teachers in every time frame. In fact, the inspired apostle Peter said, but as there were false prophets also among the people, talking about the Old Testament times, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, I hear people and have all of my life talk about, oh, you're so heavy on doctrine. You're so heavy on doctrine. It's not unusual to run across that. You're just so much concerned about what does the Bible say. Well, that sure beats being concerned about nothing it says. Yet the Bible itself, that all who say things like that, or most of them do, claim to be the Word of God, given to God, man, it emphasizes so much the study of the Bible. So much time spent with it. So much time meditating on it. So much time applying it to all phases of life. 
And yet, many today don't see much of a problem of a teaching that teaches contrary to the Bible. And yet, Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, talked about damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. Well, you know, we live in a time of great blessings. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to live. I certainly enjoy it. We have known things that our country's never known before in great blessings. But that's, that's not all there is to consider. We must also realize that we must always beware. Colossians 2.8 the devil uses all of these blessings to lead us away and cause us to neglect Bible study, prayer, the work of the kingdom, whatever it may be. It causes us not to realize what it teaches, that is what God has said in the Bible about marriage, about the home, about the role of husband and father and wife and mother, about children. All of that is as important as the spiritual family of God, the church, as to the way God wants it. It's not a matter of marriage. It's a matter of a scriptural marriage. It is God who joins a man and woman who's eligible for marriage together as husband and wife. It's God who regulates that home. Oh, the husband, he sits as head of the home, but he doesn't rule but through delegated authority. And if he studies all the Bible has to say, he's going to learn that he is concerned about his wife and his family, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So you look at every facet of society, the home being the smallest unit, and you see that all of these blessings many times have turned to be a curse because they've led us away from spiritual thinking spiritual concerns, concern to know the truth. And we tend to live just for the here and now, to satisfy the appetites of the flesh. It is said then, as we read in verse 15 of chapter 6, that the people of Jeremiah's day, and these are the people he's to try to get turned around, they could not blush. Let me qualify what I say when I say he's trying to turn them around. Actually, at the time Jeremiah came, he was telling them, it's too late to turn around. You're condemned. And there's nothing you'll do about it because you're being paid for all these hundreds of years. You have turned your mind against God. That's part of what got him into trouble is because from the perspective of the worldly people of Jerusalem round about, then he wasn't loyal. He was a turncoat. He was saying, surrender and don't bring all this hurt upon you by continuing to resist. He was trying to say, look, God is doing this because of your own sins. And you're only going to hurt yourself worse by resisting because you're going to lose when it's all over with. So surrender. So they threw him in a pit. He said what they didn't want to hear. And they were not willing to hear. And so they were utterly destroyed. They couldn't blush. Zephaniah prophet said, The unjust knoweth no shame. Zephaniah 3 5. Look at what goes on all around you. You, you can't hardly turn on the television without the rankest of language. You get used to that, and you don't guard yourself against it, then you'll pick it up. Oh, no, no, I would never do that. Yes, you can and you will. When you get around something and used to it and live in it, you will begin to embrace it and become a part of it. You know, that's one of the interesting things about the immigrants to the United States. Years ago, we talked about the melting pot where all these people basically at that time came from Europe as far as the immigrants of the 19 hundreds roughly and they were coming from Eastern Europe great influx of Italians etc and yet they wanted to be Americans and learn the American culture and speak English and learn new customs that were peculiar to the American society what is that saying 
That's saying they came to adopt all those things that were peculiar to being an American. Because that's what they wanted to be, and so forth. Well, that's the same principle I'm talking about. When you move in the area and associate with the people who love the appetites of the flesh and love to gratify them, you will adopt that. You will become part of it. So evil companionship corrupts good morals. Always has. Always will. And today all these blessings we've got around us are being used by Satan to make us very much like the world if we're not very careful and nothing much makes our face turn red anymore it doesn't cause us to feel a when you blush you feel a rush of blood to your face it's, it's, there's an embarrassment that doesn't happen much anymore you can spend one day running around this city and see some awful things that people do that years ago would have made people blush. Not anymore. So you might say blushing is a fine art. And it's been lost and it was lost in those people too. We talked about this just a little while ago. But immodesty is becoming the sign of the times. There seems to be no shame. No shame whatsoever. When I, every time I mention immodesty, the biblical definition of it. And what biblical modesty is. And we studied about it. I'm always reminding of what a preacher said many years ago when I was a younger preacher. Because he was trying to help preachers face the fact that brethren, some of them, are going to go ahead and do what they want to that's bad no matter how much Bible you preach to them. He said you can preach on modesty and what it is from now until doomsday. And they're still going to be immodest. Oh no, that would never happen among God's spiritual Israel, would it? Well, all this happened to God's flesh to Israel. And Paul says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. Wild, rebellious children and sin going unopposed should be a shame to any people. And yet it's the order of the day in this country. And for that part, all of the Western world. We need to get back to the biblical definition of spiritual purity. Then we will be morally pure. And the, it's going to begin in the home, and then it's going to begin in the local congregation as far as God's people are concerned. That's, that's what's going to be. We think, well, what a terrible thing it was when you read 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and you see the problem of a man having his father's wife and what was the impact on the church? People were puffed up about it. You just sit there and scratch your head and you say, well, how could this be among those claiming to be saints of God? Well, look round about you. Over the last 45 years, Divorce and remarriage contrary to God's will has flourished. But I'm old enough to remember when if a person was divorced, it was a stigma. Uh, people just didn't do that. Nowadays, you don't think anything about it, and I don't either. It's making a difference what we believe on it, no matter how well you teach the truth and contend for the faith regarding that. That's not the attitude of the people. But we've gone further than that. Now just people just live together. We've gone further than that. Now man lives with man. We've gone further than that. Now man marries man. And man's concept of marriage. And so we keep on going. Keep on going. The further we get away from the truth and the care of it. Well, that's what was happening in that day and time. The Israelites of Judah were outdoing the Gentiles and evil so we need to get back to the purity as God's standard the word of God describes then there's Jeremiah 6 16 the last point we'll make today they refuse to walk in the old paths 
there are always some, and at times greater majority, a greater or higher percentage of them, who are clamoring for change and for what is new. And some people want change for the sake of change. You know, if we, I, I remember that I started running into this when I was in the 60s. And it started this way when I first became exposed to it in college years. Some in the church were saying, well, look, we have the announcements. And this had to do with the order of the worship. We'll have the announcements. Maybe we have a Bible reading. Maybe we have a prayer. We have the announcements to get things started. Then we have a song or two and a prayer, a song or two in the Lord's Supper, and a song, sermon, invitation song, and closing song. We need to change that. Well, I, I have no problem with having another song. I have no problem with interrupting the song service with prayer because that's another act of worship injected among the others. We do that any time we go from one act of worship to the other in the worship assembly. But why change for the sake of change? What does that do for anybody? If you do that long enough, then you've got to say, well, now we've been doing this for six months. We've got to change we can't do anything to where we're routine and know what to expect next. I remember Brother G.K. Wallace speaking back in those days when the hippies were flying high all over the country. And he always pointed this out about, and you've got to be able to live then to realize what long hair on a male was. I don't think anybody who's come along since those days recognizes what a jolt it was to society. <laughs> but... But he always said the long hair is nothing but a flag. It's just blowing in the wind to tell you they're in rebellion to everything that's always been done a certain way. And that's pretty much so. But he had pointed out about people changing for the sake of change and about the matters of things being done just because, changing it just because it's always been done that way in the worship. He said, now imagine this. I go out to hold a lot of gospel meetings. So I'm always glad to get home. My wife welcomes me. Now, what, what do you think I would consider if one day I got home and she met me with a brass band playing welcome? The next time I got home, she had a whole parade. And the next time I got home, she had thrown a big picnic. And everything had to be different every time I got home. Then what do you think I'd think of her if she thought that way? If she acted that way? The point is we're dealing with change for the sake of change when there's no reason to change in not just matters of obligation but in matters of expediency. Do we not know what it is to expedite an authorized obligation? It gets the obligation discharged in the quickest and best way possible. People need to know what to expect. That's part of decently and in order. Unless you don't know, that's what the Holy Spirit said ought to be done concerning what the church does. Decently and in order. Well, you can't have things decently and in order unless, first of all, you respect the authority of the Bible and you know how to ascertain the authority of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ out of the words of the Bible. Then you're willing to comply with it. Then you're looking at ways to discharge those obligations. I'll use what we always use as an example of an obligation. We assemble on the first day of the week in an assembly designed to show our devotion to God or to worship God. One of the avenues or actions of worship is singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. And as we do so, we speak to one another. Now, why do we have a song director? I cannot find one in the Bible. Sometimes in gospel meetings I've asked the song director, are you authorized? And of course, all things being scripturally equal, a song leader or director is authorized. Why? It's a part of decently in order in that act of worship. It expedites the obligation that we must carry out. Same thing's true, PA system. Same thing's true of the psalm books. 
Same thing's true when it comes to learning how to sing four part harmony. Well, they didn't have four part harmony until about the year 400. What did they have before that? Well, they had various kinds of chants. I know they had a song book because I can read the book of Psalms and that was the Jewish song book and we even have some songs written in four part harmony coming directly from the Psalms. But I guarantee you one thing about those Psalms when the Jews even worshipped using them. Somebody had to start them all at the same time. Somebody had to select the psalm and how many even in a chant. But if you're going to do the things necessary to sing the songs we sing, then you have to learn the things necessary to sing the songs we sing. Now, you know, that's said in a propositional statement, isn't it? So what I just said is either true or false. Which do you say it is? True or false? So we must know where change is allowable and why we do change, and we must know what cannot be changed. We cannot change one thing the New Testament authorizes that is obligatory, and singing would be one of them. The steps in the plan of salvation. The very step that puts one into Christ and where sins are remitted, and so on and so forth. If we don't know how to write, divide the word of truth, forget learning what that passage means. Just forget it. Because you'll never be able to do things in the name of the Lord if you don't know how to handle a right or write it by the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. You'll never be able to know what is changeable and what you can change and why you should change in doing things decently and in order. We use computers now that I guarantee you, and I first moved over here 25 years ago, we use them in a way today we didn't use them then. Things can be done over computers, the internet, that couldn't be done then. And we try to utilize that. But only from the standpoint that they're authorized to expedite an obligation. In this case right now, the obligation is to preach the gospel. And it's to preach it Preach what? The gospel. It can't be changed. But it's the way that it's preached. In discharging the obligation, we seek expeditious ways to discharge the obligation. But to change for the sake of change evidences a mindset that's warped. Why do you want to change this? Oh, no, it's not like changing. What does that tell you about a person like that? in matters of which we're speaking now in matters of which we're speaking so you can be sure and see the context or the environment in which I'm talking about these things so there has to be some way that uh, evidences one refuses to walk in the old paths or you couldn't have this brought out by Israel in Jeremiah 6.16 that they had done so they were just clamoring for change so we must realize that the Bible says uh, now what it said in the beginning and it'll read the same way and mean the same way on day of judgment in the area of New Testament Christianity we must realize that the church as it's used and defined in the New Testament and the message of salvation that's found only in the New Testament are almost 2,000 years old and thus when we say seek the old paths today we're talking about going back to the New Testament pattern and not being moved from it. To talk about it as a pattern means that it's something to go by. It teaches. It guides. It directs. It is the only rule of faith and practice. Thus, it demands that it be rightly divided, that we can ascertain the truth of our King, Jesus Christ, for what we believe. Your faith can't be right if you can't study the Bible as it ought to be studied or won't because your faith is dependent upon your knowledge and if your knowledge of the Bible is wrong and your faith comes from your wrong knowledge your faith can't be right not as it ought to be so then faith cometh by hearing 
I'm hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? We walk as the word of God leads, guides, and directs us and not as things appears to us independent of the influence of the Bible on us. If I were to look around today and say, well, is the church going to make it? And I don't know anything about the Bible. I say, no, that bunch is not going to make it much. Sort of like the Romans and Jews thought the day they killed Jesus. Put into that thing. We put into that. But they didn't, did they? God is able to take that which the world says puts an end to things. And the next thing you know, it's like Jesus said it would be. The mustard seed, one of the smallest of seeds, grows into a shrub that even the birds can build a nest in. Our problem is doing things God's way, learning where His way is, being humble enough to learn how to study the Bible and to stay with it. Or else we will find ourselves walking in these five steps to destruction. The word of the Lord was a reproach. Everyone was covetous. We'll be saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. We'll get to the point of not being able to blush. And we'll refuse to walk in the old paths. And that sort of stands the way it is for the majority of the people in any age. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we hope you will be one. Because it's the only way you can go to heaven is to become a member of the church, a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Member of the body of Christ, by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Being added to the church by the Lord, when you do that, you live faithful in that church, as we have, to a certain extent, discussed what it is to be faithful. If as a child of God you've sinned, you brought reproach on the church by your conduct, we beg of you to repent of those sins, of any sin, private or public. Confess it. Pray God forgive us. If you're subject, then we invite you to come while we stand and sing.